it's a, a few minutes after now. We're expecting a handful more folks, but we'll go ahead and kick off um, so we make good use of the time. I know danae has got a lot of great content for us today. <laughs> Before she takes over, um, let me welcome you and, and offer a few announcements. And my name is Ben Underwood. I'm serving as the president of the Western North Carolina chapter of AFP. Thanks so much for the for that honor. I really appreciate it. I, I've been your president since uh, mid-2020 and continue to serve in that role and really excited and honored to do that. A um, few announcements before we get started. First, I'd like to thank our sponsors for the chapter this year. Two in particular have been longtime supporters and investors in the work uh, of AFP WNC and continue to stand by us and, and their investments are incredibly important. Those are, are University of North Carolina Asheville, is our title sponsor this year, make a significant investment in this chapter and the, the programming that we offer to our members and the Community Foundation of Western North Carolina, a longtime partner of AFP WNC, very grateful for their support and investment that makes programming like this possible. Um, I'd also like to make sure everyone is aware that through our partnership with UNC Asheville, our chapter is able to offer young professional scholarships that cover the cost of an annual membership in AFP. So that's a $95 value for a young professional membership. You must be 30 or, or younger to qualify. That's the, those, those are the rules from AFP Global. But if you or someone you know would be interested in a free membership for a year in AFP, email chapter admin at AFPWNC and we can um, go through the process of getting you registered. So if you're a new member, it's a great opportunity. One year uh, free membership, you get access to everything our chapter offers, but also all the resources through AFP Global. So again, reach out to our chapter admin, Jessica France, and she can uh, walk you through that process. In addition, uh, a couple other announcements, Philanthropy Institute, which is our day long series of workshops uh, is coming, it's a month away. July 14th at the Crown Plaza. We're very excited to be returning to in-person. We haven't held this event in person since 2019. Um, registration is heating up. We've got just under a month left until the event. We have a great keynote, Mandy Pierce, who's a local consultant and is presenting on a topic that is so crucial for all of our organizations and that's succession planning. With all of the turnover we're seeing in the nonprofit space, it's more important than ever to have a good plan in place for your organization in, in the event of leadership changes. So Mandy's going to give us some best practices and some guidance on that topic as, as part of her keynote. In addition to that, we have a wide variety of workshops on a number of topics, uh, plan giving, major gifts, uh, remote work in the nonprofit space, and a, a wide variety of other topics. So take a look at AFP WNC slash institute for the full rundown of the program. Also, in our recent newsletters, uh, there are links to registration. So registration's open now. It's a full day of professional development at a very reasonable price. So please take a, take a look at that and register as soon as you can. Um, and finally, National Philanthropy Day is coming up, not until November, but go ahead and mark your calendars. November 16th, we'll be celebrating National Philanthropy Day and recognizing people active in the philanthropic community in Western North Carolina. And the reason that's important now is nominations are open. We're seeking nominations for businesses, organizations, individuals who are philanthropists, individuals who raise money on behalf of nonprofits, and of course, um, nonprofit executives, as well as youth in philanthropy. So you're able to nominate across any of those categories. And it is a great opportunity to recognize the people who make a difference on behalf of your organizations and our community. So please head to afpwnc.org, and there are links there to online nomination forms. And those are due next month. So please uh, go ahead and focus on that. Um, very important for very important stewardship opportunity for your uh, donors and supporters. Okay, with that, I'll stop with the announcements. Let me introduce Danae. I'm incredibly excited to have Danae Aker back with us today. She presented um, to our chapter about two years ago, and uh, a few of you were able to join us for that, but most of us uh, this will be our first time hearing from Danae, at least through AFP WNC. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of Danae's bio with you, but um, you'll experience her, her warmth and depth of knowledge here in just a moment firsthand. Danae's an experienced equity and inclusion consultant, and she's really got a gift for creating brave spaces uh, where people address 
topics that are difficult around race within their organizations. She's a former mass comm professional. She's got a degree in history and 20 years of experience in news, politics, and public relations. She really focuses on helping teams understand how racist systems and policies replicate and perpetuate themselves unless they are intentionally disrupt interrupted. And she guides teams through collaborative processes to shift organization culture and position themselves to be industry leaders with an equitable lens. She works with community groups, churches, a variety of nonprofit agencies, and for-profit companies that seek to be more culturally responsive. So with that, Danae, I'll turn things over to you for today's presentation. Great, thank you so much, Ben. And thank you all for being here today. I really um, look forward to having this conversation and I always look forward to having this conversation with you. I um, am going to share my screen and hope that that works out well for everyone involved. Um, because we're gonna go ahead and jump into a conversation about philanthropy, power, and oppression. Um, and what we want to center in this is power. Um, so Tiffany and Mark, I wanna thank you for having your screens on. I am going to invite anyone who can and who can and is willing to please turn on your screen. Um, I do not do a good job of speaking and lecturing just to folks, right? Um, I encourage interaction. And in fact, I'm going to ask you for your engagement as we go through things today. Thank you all so much. Wonderful. Thanks for doing that for me. All right. Let's see if we can make this work. Do you all see my screen? Awesome sauce. Thank you for that, Robin. Thanks. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about my company, Culture Value LLC. I will not read it directly from the screen because frankly, that's just some words on the screen that were pulled from the website, right? Um, Culture Value is uh, DEI, that is diversity, equity, inclusion. And a lot of times I will add a B for belonging consulting firm that really came out of the work that I was doing right there in the mountains. Um, it is very community-based, and I say that to say that I work with organizations, um, whether they are nonprofit or for-profit church groups, like actual community groups, um, to fulfill their mission and their visions um, through providing an equity, usually a racial equity lens and analysis that is heavily steeped in whatever the work is that they are doing or hoping to do in the community. For today, I am going to ask if we can agree to these things for this conversation. And I'm gonna get through some things quickly, but please, 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 if I say something that raises an eyebrow or that really like confuses you, please stop me. Either drop it in the chat or just open up your microphone and say, hey, hold up, got a question, and then and we can address it then. But going in, I do wanna ask that um, we all remain open, curious, like leading with curiosity. When, when we, if we feel ourselves getting kind of up and anxious, inquire about our, and for ourselves, like what is behind and underneath that emotion. Embrace paradox. I always say two seemingly contradictory things can be true at the same time. For instance, my husband is both lovely and wonderful, and he's also the reason I drink, right? Two seemingly contradictory things can be absolutely true at the same time. Notice discomfort, especially your own. Just be aware of it. Breathe, keep breathing, because I might say things like whiteness, and I need y'all to keep breathing through that. Remember your own power and influence because we are talking about power and a lot of times we use that word and we're thinking of it in the abstract form or about somebody who has a lot of something. And the reality is we all have some power and I'm asking that you all remember yours, particularly in your development role. And most importantly, always, 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 always maintain hope. The first thing I would like to know is, 
Are you uncertain what equity or even just race has to do with your work or your particular role within the organization? This will help me get to know um, a little bit about you and folks in the room. So um, Ben is going to drop into the chat a Mentimeter link that should take you to a poll or you can use your cameras and capture this QR code. No, I don't actually know what that means, but I only know that it actually takes you to the poll on your phone and you can do the poll on your phone. I am going to stop sharing my screen for the moment. Thank you, Ben, for dropping that into the chat. And I, aha, I'm going to make my way over to the poll and see if I can share that for you all. Share the results that are coming in. Keep taking, keep filling it out if you haven't gotten to it yet. And I'm going to share the results with you all. Can you see it? Great. So this tells me a lot about who we're talking to today. So a, just three of you said that you see the relevance for your organization, but not clear about your role, which is great to know. And I think that that is always a wonderful question we should be asking ourselves. And most of you who answered understand um, the equity connection to your role. Thank you all for filling that out. So my next question for you is, and you can just drop this, drop this into the chat. For whom are you raising money? And so that question is not just about your organization, but also who is going to be served if you're successful in your work. And if you could drop your answers to that into the chat. Survivors of sexual violence and human trafficking. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Important work. Children and families, entrepreneurs with a focus on women. Thank you, Becca. You're serving me. Appreciate you. Wow. Y'all are doing amazing work. Thank you. And I'm going to ask, thank you, Jess. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Whitney and Olivia. Okay, so I, I generally ask people to get a good picture in your mind of who you're serving, right? It can be a name, it can be a face, it could be a few faces, right? Just have a good picture in your mind of who the people that you're serving. And I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. Now, Ben is going to drop into the chat a Padlet link. And so this is perfect, this is completely anonymous. And we'll ask that you fill this out. Why do your donors contribute to your organization? Now, you can answer this question with your assumptions, right? Or maybe you've heard directly from donors. My guess is many of you have done surveys and that sort of thing, and this question may have come up. So why are your donors contributing? Danae, this application is new to me, and I'm not sure how to interact with it. Okay, I'm going to go to it and support you in that right now. Okay, thank you. Beg your uh, patience as I try to figure all of these things out myself. So you see the little bubbles and the reason to give, correct? There should be a little pink plus sign at the bottom. If you click it, a little digital post-it note should come up that you can write on. And I see, I see some of you are already typing. Is that working for you? Oh, 
Awesome, thank you. And you can still see my screen, correct? So I'm saying things like shared philosophy and or mission with organizations and they have empathy for the people who are served. Um, donors believe in the mission to reduce waste and ease hunger. They have confidence in our ability to fulfill our mission. I see for one of you, many of the families, many of, many of the donors are families of the students and support the work and mission of the school. Okay, so what I am seeing here um, is a lot of shared values with your organizations. Um, and just by, if, if you all could nod or put your thumbs up, um, are most of your donors people who are somehow directly connected to your mission? If you would keep your thumbs up. Robin, I see you kind of, maybe, maybe, as I go through the screen. Yeah, um, and then I'm seeing some people whose the donors are not directly, like, are not directly um, impacted or connected. Thank you all for that. Thank you. Okay. The the but the the running theme of this though is that people want to help. Am I right about that? People just generally want to help. Okay. Um, and that is great. Helping is always always good. The question then, and anybody can open your mic and at, and answer. It's not a round robin, so you don't have to, but I'm curious to know what your answers might be to this question. Um, why are people in need? So the people you serve, why are they in need? And specifically, why are they in need? And why is your organization in need, therefore, um, of donors? So why are the people you serve in need of your donors? Um, I'll, I'll share um, systems, yeah. systems of oppression. Okay. Anyone else? We provide um, free non-judgmental community mediation services for a variety of conflicts. And I think people are in need of our services because um, the government systems that exist to help people with conflicts aren't meeting their needs. Um, and so people are instead wanting a community-based alternative where they can be in charge of making the decisions about what's best for themselves. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So do I hear you saying, Laura, that um, you have an organization that is guided by the people you serve and what they say they need? So the I think sort of the philosophical basis of the field of community mediation is that that we provide a, a framework and a, and a place and a, um, an opportunity for people to have the conversations that they want to have and come up this, with the solutions that they want to arrive at. And those um, conversations are facilitated by peer community volunteers. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm stopping. I'm going to stop sharing my screen just so that I can look at you all and not have to scroll through the four boxes that I can see at any given time. Anyone else want to weigh in on why? Um, I work with queer and I'm sorry. Um, see Whitney. Um, 
work with queer and trans youth and we know that they're exponentially more likely to be facing homelessness, um, to have lack of resources and support at home, um, and particularly face a lot of bullying at school. So we create support spaces for those youth and try to center youth leadership so that we're meeting them with what needs they're coming to us with. Um, and I think that many of our supporters have either experienced that or are seeing their children experience that and want to support. Okay. Great, thank you. Anyone else before we move on? I'll speak for um, Food Connection. This is Marisha. Hi, Marisha. Hi, Danye. How are you? Good, good. Good. Um, so we, um, in the beginning of the work that we did, served primarily agency partners who served their communities in need, veterans, um, unsheltered folks. And through, we learned a lot through the pandemic, and we are expanding now to reach the individuals experiencing and families experiencing food insecurity that fall through the gaps um, with rising cost of living, especially in Asheville, and families that are working sometimes two and three jobs and still fall through those, the, fall through the cracks and don't receive um, food assistance. Okay. Thank you. So it's interesting. This is um, a wonderfully diverse group of people. And by people, I mean like people representing a diverse group of organizations, right? that are serving a number, a variety of different needs in the community. I am going to submit to you that as uh, someone, as Lori has put into the chat and alluded, is alluding to a complex web of systems and assumptions, right, that the reason for many, if not all, of the needs that you all are seeking to meet um, is a function of a dominant culture, right? The culture of a, like the normalcy, the supremacy, I will even say of a dominant culture, at the very least in our country, we are not looking worldwide, um, that is failing to meet the needs of too many people. Jess, I see you nodding. I'm guessing you're nodding in agreement. Am I right? Anybody want to jump in for me and just yell out what the dominant culture is they might be referring to? White supremacy? So <laughs> <laughs> she said it and I might like start to shake and shiver, right? Because that's a hard phrase to sit with, white supremacy. All right. So since Jess said it, I didn't say it first, y'all. Jess did. Um, we are going to unpack that just for a moment because we're going to just skip over a whole bunch of things to go directly into this conversation, right? Because there's no other way to do it than to do it. <laughs> yes, Lori says that as an old white mountain woman with money and the bank and nothing to fear. I'm going to disagree with you, Lori. I appreciate the transparency and I think that there is something to fear, right? Though I think those of us who deeply, and I think most of us do, right, deeply love humanity, deeply love each other, right, deeply love the idea of community. And I am, I am convinced that most people actually do believe in equity, even if they don't know to call it that, right, then there is something to fear. Because anytime that that is in jeopardy, right, we have something to fear. So I will say, um, you know, if I am living well, sitting pretty, right, in my gated community, if the majority of the people in my community don't have access to that, I am in danger. Now, I can respond to that inequality by creating more inequities and putting up more walls, or I can respond by supporting a more open and equitable society. So I'm guessing the fact that we're all in, you know, nonprofits and raising money, that we're falling on the side of openness and equity. If that is not where you are living, you can hang out, but you might be in the wrong room. Okay. 
So are we ready to go to talk about the creation of a dominant culture? So, and I also want to say, in case anybody has any questions, because this really is hard. And I, you know, I know that Asheville and Western North Carolina, parts of Western North Carolina are all left of center and all the way woke, right? All the wokeness exists right there in Asheville. And um, thank you, Laura. I am reading even while I am trying to speak. So thank you very much. I appreciate your comments. Um, that we don't always give enough context for the ways in which we are talking about these things. So like you and enough compassion to folks who may not be having the same conversations that we are having or who may not have gone to that REI training or building bridges or some other diversity training, right? So I do want to make clear that when Jess said white supremacy, and then when I am saying white supremacy, I am not talking about the Klan. I am not talking about the little fellas in khakis with tiki torches running through Charlottesville, okay? I am talking about the normalcy of whiteness, right? The universality of whiteness. Like the assumption that, and, and I have it because I was born and raised and fed on this culture that we have here, right? The presumption that our way is actually universal. And that is often hidden, right? We don't always see the ways in which what we are assuming is the norm and universal culturally is not, right? And so there's a really popular conversation moving around about white supremacy culture characteristics. We will not have a chance to get into that today. Um, but that you know, there's a whole list, right? You can look it up and people are like, oh, perfectionism, sense of urgency, worship of the written word. That has nothing to do with race, right? That's not, those aren't bad things. And I will say, no, they aren't. But the ways in which we assume that that is how communities and cultures and societies have always operated and are all operating today is what we mean, is what I mean when I say the normalcy and the universality of what is really a Euro Western and European culture. So we're gonna hop right in. I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. I am actually going to skip over a few slides because y'all already got it. Y'all already there and don't need all of those. Um, I do want to show you um, a couple of interesting slides. Um, just about what wealth, and of course by wealth, what I mean is not like that we all have a million dollars sitting around, but like what wealth looks like across races, right? So this, this came out in June of 2020 from Forbes, a study from Forbes, looking at median household net worth as of 2016. That little pie, turquoise pie, is black household net worth as of 2016, which is just below $50,000 a year. I mean, $50,000, not $50,000 a year. And white household net worth was um, around 200,000. Now this does not mean that all black households have a net worth of under 50,000 and that all white households have a net worth of 200,000, right? We're looking at we're looking at big numbers and trends. Now, I just looked this up the other day just for you all in fact, um, to see what if anything had changed in the latest numbers and the, this is from the Federal Reserve which has recently um, pulled this from the Survey of Consumer Finances. Um, as of the tw as of 2019, and it broke it out even further, right? Of median net worth of households. Now, I want to point out that this is post a black president. This is including Oprah, Michael Jordan, uh, um, Cardi B. I don't know, like all the very wealthy. <laughs> famous people of color, right? This includes all of those numbers. And it includes the numbers of, you know, white Appalachians. 
and this, which this is also from Forbes in 2020, because I just think it's a fascinating, fascinating graph. Um, look at, so the tiny light sliver of blue at the bottom is median black household wealth. Look at the sliver from 1968 compared to the sliver in 2016. Anybody want to open up your microphones and tell me what you're noticing? Can I ask a clarifying question on that one? Yeah. So percentage of, of is this net worth of white and black households combined and then showing the relative percentages? Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, thank right. you. So, I mean, it's pretty stark that this very small sliver for the median black household wealth is even smaller in 2016 than it was in 1968. Yeah. So I show this, right, because people are like, well, the work I do has nothing to do with race, right? In nonprofits, period, right? Not all, obviously, there's some nonprofits that have that are very, very racially centered, but there are a lot of nonprofits, right? That goes, well, we don't have anything. It really doesn't have anything to do with race. We have a saying in the Black community that says, if white America gets a cold, Black America has pneumonia or the flu. And that, so that is to say that um, I try to stay away from absolutes. So I'm going to say so much actually does have to do with race, if only an impact, right? So if there is an issue with eating disorders, right, there are ways in which the impact of that disorder is going to lay differently on a family of color than it would on a white family. If there is an issue with mental illness or domestic violence, right? Like, and, and I want to talk about domestic violence and pull that out a little bit, right? Because there are ways in which that the impact of however we respond to that problem lands differently. The impact is differently dependent upon race. Right down to, for instance, if I were to call the police right now as a black woman um, on a domestic violence call or domestic disturbance. And again, I am in Florida, very sunny, very nice gated community in which I live. There is a chance that I could be the one who ends up hurt or even killed on a call like that, right? So we have to be willing to hold that even if the work that we are doing doesn't feel like it is directly about race, that if we fail to consider race and its impact, we are not fully serving the community that we are seeking to serve. And this framing and analysis hopefully will help you as development folks frame your acts. Now, I am not suggesting that you put in any of your acts right now, white supremacy culture, just please don't do that. <laughs> right? But the framing and the analysis can actually help you frame your ask differently. So I'm very aware of the time I'm going to keep going. So let's, and I'm going to give you the analysis. It's going to be very short, very quick, very brief. This is not everything. It's just some of the things. So we have this narrative, this national narrative that is beautiful, frankly, I would say, right? And that we've all bought into, even if we don't believe the whole story today, right? So the idea is that there were these people came, sometimes we say they came because they were looking for religious freedom, right? Doesn't matter. They came because they were looking for something better. What we know is that there was this first English colony. We don't have to know the dates, but the dates are here. John Roth. A man named John Roth at some point married a woman by the name of Pocahontas. I would say that not only was it, eh, we, can we question how we characterize it as marriage? And we can even question her name because that is not actually her name. Um, but the point is, we know that that was a story. Disney told us it was a wonderful love story, in case you missed it. Don't believe the Disney version. Um, we know that at some point, as debatable as people want to make it, what is indisputable was that in the year 1619, <laughs> there were a group of Africans, about 20, who had been kidnapped and brought to the colonies. And we know that throughout this time, there were these 
cough ups of violence that killed off the indigenous people who were already here. And I am not making light of this. So this is a story I think that no matter where we sit, no matter you know how steeped in history we are, we can all agree on this story. Here's what we typically don't know, that between in this early part of our colonial history, right, between 1607 and 1682, there were over 90,000 immigrants from Europe in this country. And more than half of them, like more than three quarters of them were chattel bond laborers. Really quickly, somebody open up your microphones and tell me, tell us what we mean by this when we say they were chattel bond laborers. Does anybody know? Is that sometimes what's called an indentured servant where is that similar? Right. So chattel bond laborers, right, are working people who don't own themselves, who don't own their own um, outcomes in life, who, you know, who don't have their own agency because it's not honored. So slaves are chattel bond laborers, but we refer to these folks as indentured servants. And there is a real reason for that because presumably they signed a contract. I'm using scare quotes for all the things. They signed a contract and came over to work for a set period of time. It could be four years, it could be seven years, it could be 10 years, right? Um, but the reality is the work is so hard here at this time that one might not live out a seven year contract. So at this point, effectively, particularly in the beginning, this is lifetime servitude. And the story that we don't tell, the narrative that we don't tell, because again, we're talking about narratives because what you all presumably do is create narratives to convince people to give. So the narrative that we tell in this country, this does not fit. And that Ben, can I ask who your people are real quickly? Do you identify as white? Sorry, so no. mute. yes, I identify as white. Well, you would not have in 1607 or 1650 or 1682. Okay, because white folks did not exist. There was no such group of people called white at this point in US history. But those of you who do identify as white today, I'm just saying that three quarters of the people here working the land look like y'all. That is not the story we tell. And so it's interesting, right? There are these things that are happening during this period that we see, we see some evidence of racial acceptance and cooperation, if not full on equality. I will say there was equality in the oppression because whether or not you were English or Scottish or Irish or Dutch at this time, more likely Scottish or Dutch or English or African at this time, there was equality in oppression, right? So. Um, there were many Africans who were known to be married to European laborers, and there doesn't seem, there's no legal evidence that this, there's any, there's much opposition to this. And in fact, records from one county show that a quarter to all children born to European women servants were, had fathers of a different racial background, right? So it may have been Black or African, may have been Indigenous. So this is the lay of the land at about this time. They would not have been mixed because this is not a term that we would have been using at that time. That is a contemporary term that I'm using. But then in 1640, right? Anybody know the story of John Punch? 1640, an African by the name of John Punch runs away with two of his buddies, one Dutchman, one Scotsman. Um, they run away together. They're all caught. Records from the colony of Virginia tell us that the Dutchman and the Scotsman got four additional years of servitude added as a punishment. John Punch was sentenced to perpetual servitude. What does this tell us? What are you noticing? Beginning of enslaving folks. Yeah, there's some, we can certainly see that starting to come along because one, if John Punch is sentenced as a punishment to perpetual servitude, then, that, then we know that he was not what we think of as a slave before this, right? So he probably also had a contract for indenture, obviously. And his punishment 
for running away, which by the way is trying to regain his freedom, his own agency. agency. So we know that his punishment was to be enslaved for life. Again, a different story than the one that we're typically told. And yes, we are seeing a move towards enslaving a particular group of people versus another group of people. And I wanna say also, right, that this might be our first recorded case of sentencing disparities along racial, racial lines. I'm just saying. So my mom used to say that there's nothing new under the sun. Here we are. In 1662, Virginia enacts a law that if an Englishman has a um, child with a Negro woman or an enslaved woman in this case, that the child will take on the status of the woman, of the mother. Now, this is significant because yes, as the slide states, it makes slavery hereditary, but that this policy flies in the face of hundreds of years of English common law. And somebody check me if I'm wrong, Virginia was an English colony, right? Why are we changing the rules? Money people, y'all, we need to look at, when we are looking at oppression, because this is not about being mean to Black people, right? So when we are looking at oppression, we have to always be willing to look at the advantage as well. So the question is, who does this advantage? Ben, may I use you as an example? I think I did this two of years course. ago. Yeah. This means that Ben can invite his brother, his father, his cousin, his best friend from France over for dinner for a long vacation and make his own workforce. It is nasty and ugly and gross, and it is true. Right? So we, this is a, a place, right, where we have to be willing to look at the advantage. So even in your work, right, as you're framing asks, at least for yourself, I'm not saying like a different workshop as to how we can incorporate an analysis into our ask, but even as we're doing it, be aware for ourselves of where we are serving a marginalized or oppressed group and where there is advantage. So in, 17, in 1676, Bacon's Rebellion happened. Nathaniel Bacon um, is like the cousin of Governor Berkeley of Virginia and um, wants more land and he can't get it, right? And so he can't get it just by asking for it the way that he wants because of any particular privilege that comes with his status. So he eventually gathers a group of other indentured and poor Right? So they may be free, but still poor, um, in, like Europeans, Africans, even some indigenous folk. And this becomes a more than year long rebellion, full out revolt against the land of gentry, right? That small number of people who are holding land in power. And again, it lasts for more than a year before that revolt is put down. I think of it as what could have been America's first revolution. Didn't happen that way. It was put down. And within 20 years, we see a strategy that pops up. And it doesn't just pop up because there's years worth of correspondence between the landed gentry and the crown about how can we make sure another one of these never happens again. They employed a divide and conquer strategy that creates a new group of people who are no longer Scottish, Dutch, French, English, but are from this moment on known to be white. Now, Jess, may I use you as an example because I can see you on my screen? Jess and I are friends. We have our, you know, we're just neighbors, right? And we have our little pieces of land, we have our families, we're farming together. Um, we may or may not be indentured, but whatever it is, we are not Thomas Jefferson kind of rich. Um, and, and, you know, our families are a family. The government says, okay, Jess, you are no longer 
Scottish, you are now white. Jess is probably gonna say, whatever, and keep it moving, right? It means nothing to her until we start giving it meaning. So in 1691, we create a group of people called white. I want to be clear that by 1705, when Virginia passes a law requiring that landowners provide their white servants, whose indenture is up, 50 acres of land, 30 shillings, that's money y'all, 10 bushels of corn and a musket, what are we doing here? We're making white mean something. We are creating now, not just white people, but the advantage that comes with being white because you don't get this if you were anything but identified as white. So what are we gonna do with our musket? And by the way, Jess, you don't have a musket, but assuming that your husband is white, he does. What is he gonna do with the musket? Anybody know? Hunt. What now? Hunt. Hunt, right, because, you know, Jess is my girlfriend, right? And I know that Jess has got to eat. So if he wants to stay married, he's got to hunt and feed Jess and those babies. Yes, he's going to hunt. He is also going to protect his land and family and home. Who's he protecting it from? Come on, it's 1705. Who are we protecting our home, the home and land? Oh, Native Americans? Yeah. Really? So you don't have it. <laughs> right. We called them savages at the time. Right. Right. But they really were people who were like, wait a minute, that's my land. That's yeah, just the people on. who were here first. Right. 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 But, but and, and like, I don't mean that in a theoretical sense. I mean, like, literally, it's not like the government was giving away land that wealthy landowners were sitting on. Right. They were giving 50 acres of land as a part of our early westward expansion. I don't mean west, you know, out into the Midwest and for far west at this point. I mean, like, west from the coast, from coastal Virginia, right, on and to the inland. That's not great land, but it is land that is occupied. So literally, right, Ben, I'm going to use Ben, is defending his land from people who were like, well, wait, wait a minute, yesterday that was mine, right? So let's be clear about that. Also, and this is the piece that people don't know because I speak to a lot of groups who are like, well, my people never owned slaves. And I was like, that is probably very true because you had, because most people didn't. But what you also had to do, what Ben also has to do with that musket now is patrol for African enslaved people who are trying to take back their freedom. This is an early police force created by specifically named white people who have been freed from their indenture. Look, and not just free, like they weren't given freedom, right? Ben worked hard. He served the time that he was contracted to serve and was, was rewarded, right? His work was repaired, given reparations, right? For the work that he'd done. So it's not like he was just given it. He worked hard for it, but the only reason right he was able to access that opportunity was because he was white so we created a group of people called white and we put that into law we gave whiteness advantage and put that into law and with this musket and other pieces of in other policies and legislation we also created white dominion over cultures and people of color. That dominion is what we're looking at because another word for that is supremacy. So when we say white supremacy, right, it gets people really up in arms, literally, <laughs> literally, right? And if we can take a breath and take a step back and hear what the word means, we're talking about an old system that was created a long, long time ago that literally and legally put white people as supreme, 
to all others. One quick thing though, because I want to be clear, right, that we're not talking about good and bad people. Ben is a good person, right? I'm not 50 acres of land. While, look, I'd be happy to be sitting on 50 acres of land in the mountains of Western North Carolina today, those 50 acres of land make him Vanderbilt rich. Does that give him the Biltmore? No, right? But it does give him just enough to be willing to fight for, just enough to be quiet and just enough to be willing to fight for and to stay in line for. So we have a Declaration of Independence in 1776, but then we continue with these policies and practices, right, that were formed before we even became an official country. So. In 1785, the Land Ordinance Act was just that you had, it was a, a good deal on getting more land, again, part of our westward expansion, but it was only available to people identified as white. The Naturalization Act, 1790, what the, the first law as to what it meant to become an American, you had to be white in order to immigrate right here and become a citizen on through 1862 with the homestead act like that is what the ingles were ingles wilder and her family were benefiting from charles ingles was a hard worker right absolutely great people and they only had access to the land because they were white because it was only available to white people the new deal legislation which transformed the country created a middle class overwhelmingly went to white people. The Federal Housing Act was legal, federal government mandated segregation of neighborhoods. Even Social Security, while it appeared to be race neutral, when it was first passed, was not accessible to people who were domestic and agricultural workers. Again, no mention of race, but the impact was completely racialized. And the impact lasts for generations. Because again, using Jess as my friend, let's say Jess and I make the same amount of money, but our parents could, my parents could not collect social security, her parents can. That means when her parents are old and no longer working, they are fine, they're the very least okay. Jess can spend her hard earned money taking care of her kids, sending her kids to college, buying a home. That means when my parents who can't collect social security, when they can no longer work, I have to use my hard-earned money, the same amount of money as Jess, to take care of my parents, my husband's parents, and our kids, probably some aunts and uncles too. That is why those graphs we showed you earlier about wealth, that is why it looks the way that it looks, because it accumulates over time. The GI Bill overwhelmingly went to white GIs. Many, many, many Black GIs, most Black GIs, were denied access to college education with the GI Bill, as well as homes, home mortgages with the GI Bill. So all of this accumulates, the advantages accumulate, the disadvantages accumulate over time, so that when we get to the stimulus package in 2009, and the latest one, right, it is perfectly, it's perfectly understandable that the incomes, the outcomes, the outcomes, and the impacts are racialized. I just want to point to these two Supreme Court cases. They are not the only two, there are more, but these are two Supreme Court cases of men seeking citizenship in the 20s and being denied citizenship because they are not classified as white. Well, this isn't just about way back then, although at this point, this is almost 100 years ago, right? This is about the ongoing impact. So when we look at where we are today, and I'm going to take this down, stop sharing my screen. So when we look at where we are today and the work that you all are doing, right, we have to be willing to at least consider racialized impact. And how does birth of the one drop well, thank you, and I wasn't seeing the chat as I was talking earlier. And how and can our analysis of this impact the ways that we are asking for money? I am not saying, because I know having worked with development folks in the past and currently, um, but the question is, oh, if we say all of this awful stuff to our donors, they might not be on board anymore and won't give us money. 
I am not suggesting that you risk um, your development work at all. What I'm saying is the first step is to get a healthy fuller, right? Because I am always still learning myself, analysis of the problem. Those of you who have participated in REI, a very popular two-day workshop that happens in Western North Carolina a lot, they say all the time, diagnosis determines treatment. In our nonprofits, we are treating problems every day. The question is, have we most accurately diagnosed the problem? And that is a consideration that should go into the work that you do as people who are raising money for your organizations. I'm sure there are lots of questions, but I have managed to talk right through until the very end. I do apologize for that. If it's okay with you, I will drop my email address into the chat and you can ask your questions. And if there's a minute, people can open up a mic and ask a question now. I just typed one in the chat, but I'll mention it here. First of all, thank you so much for that. It was very insightful for me. Um, will you be in person in July? That was question one. Are you coming I will to the not. event? <laughs> okay. Um, that makes sense given where you're where you're at. And then what is this two day workshop? I, I'm new to North Carolina. So what's the workshop you mentioned? It's called REI, um, Racial Equity Institute. It is not a Western North Carolina event. Thank you, Jess, for dropping it in the chat. Um, you can go to the website and if you email me, Becca, um, I can make sure you are on the list because there's a community, a grassroots, right, community group that makes it available to the public um, in Western North Carolina. And so we will have one. There's going to be a two-day one in July and in August and I think in September. So if you email me, I am technically out of the office because I am conducting, I'm hosting an equity immersion travel trip starting tomorrow. But um, if you email me, I will be in touch next week to let you know about REI. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody for joining us today. And thanks, thanks Danae. That was incredible. Uh, <laughs> and quick. You cover a lot of ground in an hour. I really appreciate it. Thanks everybody for engaging in a really challenging but important discussion. Uh, appreciate you making the space for this and incorporating this into your, your thinking about your work. Hope to see many of you in July. Uh, until then, uh, thank you, Danae, again for joining us and for, for making your email and available to answer questions offline. It means a lot. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And Lori, reach out to me and we can talk about that as well. I saw your comment, but I wasn't able to respond. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you soon.